Well, since our study in the Lord's, uh, the Lord's Prayer, we've been talking about kingdom principles. What does it mean to live and to work and to help build the kingdom of God here on earth? What does it mean? And, and how does it mean living differently than the world in which we are in? Because there are two kingdoms, the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God. There's the city of God and, and uh, the city of man. And I'd like to begin our time together as we as we look at this. It's from a, it's a trailer from the movie Wall Street. Now I have to make a caveat. I have not seen the full movie Wall Street, so I'm not because I haven't seen it. I'm not recommending it. But I would like for you to watch as we begin our time together. Watch this trailer by Gordon Gecko speaking to a large crowd of wealthy business people. Um, so Reggie. Contrast what you just heard from the words of Jesus. He's in a crowd. He's been teaching. And someone spoke up and asked this question. Teacher, and I'm reading from the, um, the New Living Translation this morning. Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. And this was a common thing that people would bring questions to to their rabbi, you know, practical questions, and the rabbi would give them answers. And so th this guy, um, fought, you know, had two sons, and um, he's telling, hey, we need to divide the estate. Tell my brother to do that. Notice Jesus didn't totally answer the question, but he answered a much more important question. And he often did this kind of thing. And Jesus replied, friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? And then he said, beware, don't be greedy for what you don't have. Real life is not measured by how much we own. And then he gave an illustration. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. In fact, his barns were full to overflowing. And so he said, I know, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And then I'll have enough room to store everything. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. And you know, the crowd hearing this would have thought, that's great because there is a perception and understanding, and we often have it in our world and society today, that God blesses us, and he does in many ways. And so if a man is doing well, his fields produce a good crop, he's being blessed by God. And so that's, that's true. But then Jesus goes on, and, and this is what he often did. You know, he pulls them along a little ways, and they all draw in. And then he has a punchline, and it, it all makes them angry. It makes them think, and it does that to this. So this is what God said to him. You fool. You will die this very night. And then who will get it all? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. It's all about having a rich relationship with God, putting him first and foremost in our lives. Now, while few people would be so bold as to say out loud what Gordon Gecko did in that video, that greed is good, that greed is right, that greed works, greed is what drives many of us in our society. We're not going to come out and, and say that, but that's what drives a lot of American society. And again, this is nothing new because Jesus addressed this right in this parable uh, 2,000 years ago. But our capitalistic society encourages greed as a driving force behind it. 
From the, rich, from the lifestyles of the rich and famous, I'm showing my age here. Some of you probably don't even have never seen or heard of that program. From the lifestyles of the rich and famous to Dynasty to Dallas to much of reality TV today to almost all advertising, the appeal is to our greedy nature. Advertisers spend billions of dollars telling you that buying their product from toothpaste to luxury automobiles will make you happy and show the world that you are a success. And you know what? If it didn't work, they wouldn't spend those billions of dollars doing that. But like all appetites, greed is never satisfied. The more you feed it, the greater an appetite grows. The only way to quell an appetite is to starve it, not to feed it. Have you ever bought new stuff to organize and hold your old stuff in order to make room for more stuff? Do you sometimes go, in, go into a store and find some nice boxes and you think, oh, I'm going to take those good boxes home because uh, someday I'm going to have a use for them to put all my good stuff in to store it. Container stores and storage businesses thrive on that kind of thinking. Jesus warns us, take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Have you ever been so envious or wishful for another person's life that you were unable or unwilling to celebrate his or her success, abilities, or good fortune? You look at them and you say to yourself, what about me? That's not fair. Why isn't that me? Take care. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. Has the grammar in your life ever been predominantly in the first person singular? I. I want. I need. I did. I hope. I achieved. I accomplished. I will. I. 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 The rich man in this parable used I or my 11 different times. He had no concern for anyone else. Take care. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. Have you ever gone out and bought something to make yourself feel better? Maybe because you were sad or lonely or angry or maybe just plain scared. You wanted a new life and a new feeling more than a new thing, but you bought the new thing anyway. Take care. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. If any of this sounds familiar, or if you answered yes to any of these questions, or even if you didn't, but you understand what I'm talking about, then you might just know something about greed in your own life. Now, I say that not as a judgment or a criticism, but in recognition that I, and maybe you too, can be as much a barn builder as the guy in the parable that Jesus was talking about. A year ago last May, uh, a year ago from last May, Chris and I were invited by my sister and brother-in-law to take our first cruise to the Bahamas. We spent a couple of days, we were leaving from uh, Fort Lauderdale, so we spent a couple of days in Fort Lauderdale. And while we were there, we took a boat cruise out onto some of the canals. Now, I didn't realize this, but there are over 300 miles of canals in Fort Lauderdale, and, um, and it's known as the Venice of America. I didn't realize that, but anyway, we took a boat cruise out into some of the, the canals. 
And the tour guide pointed out many of the elaborate mansions, these huge mansions and these huge yachts that were parked out in front of the mansions. And he was telling us, you know, who some of these rich and famous people were. And we were kind of in awe, kind of overwhelmed by the wealth that was all around us. And you know what? Never once during that time did I think about how blessed I was to have an old, dirty kayak hanging in my garage. On another occasion, several years ago, I was blessed to go on a mission trip to the Dominican Republic. And we were graciously invited to eat in some of the people's homes that we were working with. Homes with leaking, rusting, corrugated tin roofs, with walls that you could see through, Maybe one light bulb shining dimly over the whole uh, house. Curtains divided the rooms. But they were joyful. And they were grateful. And they eagerly shared what they had with their guests. Beans and rice have never tasted so good as when they were served with a large dose of hospitality. The community that we worked in was called El Cayon, which means the road to nowhere. How would you like to live on the road to nowhere? It was a cinder block wall that divided the wealthy people from the very poor people. After spending two weeks working side by side with these loving and grateful people, I never once had a wish for a bigger home, a newer car, or a bigger paycheck. And then on the way home, we had about an eight-hour layover in Miami at the the airport there, and and there was some free or cheap transportation um, that took us that you could take to go to South Beach. And so rather waiting uh, in the airport, some of us in our group decided that we would go to South Beach and, and tour around. What a contrast it was to the Dominican Republic. From exotic sports cars to extreme wealth of all kinds to way overpriced food. It was hard to deal with such excess without thinking about this, how this extremely lavishly lived lifestyle could be better used in the Dominican Republic. Take care. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. As Jesus warns, there are all kinds of greed. It might be cars, clothing, cash, or any other tangible thing. It might be amassing money, land, or other wealth. But greed can also be about time, attention, approval, love, knowledge, power, control, being right, being in charge, or a thousand other things. Ultimately, though, greed is not about any of these things. They are just symptoms of a deeper issue. The issue is not about quantity, how much you have, but about the condition of the heart. Greed is really just a way of dealing with our own feelings of of deficit and emptiness. It's not so much about having enough as being enough, enough, being enough. When we believe ourselves to be deficient, when we lose our belief in ourselves, when we feel as though we are not enough, then we get greedy. We use things and other people to help fill the hole and the void that is within us. 
Greed deceives and it convinces us that if we just have more blank, then we will be blank. And you can fill in the blanks. For example, if I have more money, then I will have a more secure future, kind of like this guy in the parable. The real issue, however, might be fear, uncertainty, or the unpredictability of life. Or it could be, if I get more books hitting home right here, then I'll have more knowledge and more answers. People will see me as studious and intelligent. If I can get more of your time and attention, then I'll feel accepted, important, and relevant. If I can gain more power and more control, and then I'll be safe and respected, and no one can hurt me. Greed uses external things to deal with internal matters. And you know what? It rarely works. It leaves us wanting more. Always seeking the next dollar, the next new book, the next word of approval. Greed steals and deprives us of what we want most. Greed robs us of joy and peace in our lives. Now that doesn't mean that possessions are inherently wrong. The Bible is full of wealthy people who were blessed and used by God to do amazing things. The key is, How do you manage your money? Where do you put your trust? In God or in your money? It's interesting, maybe ironic, that on our money, our motto is, in God we trust. But is that true? That was the problem with the rich and the successful man in the parable. He trusted in his wealth to provide for his future rather than in God. Rather than thinking about how he could use his abundant blessing to share and to help other people, he only thought about himself. I need a bigger barn, a bigger house, a bigger boat to hold all of my stuff. The antidote to greed is not necessarily cleaning out the closet, throwing away my books, or giving away my belongings, although in some cases that might be a first step that needs to happen. But the real work in dealing with greed is interior work. Greed shows me to be living in poverty towards God. And the antidote to greed then is to be rich toward God. And that means that we invest ourselves in each other and in the world and in the same ways that Jesus invested himself while he was here on earth through love, mercy, compassion, justice, hope, courage, acceptance, truth, beauty, and generosity. This is the wealth of God. This is the life God shares and invests in us through Jesus Christ. And so to be rich toward God begins with knowing that we are already God's beloved treasure. We have been bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ, and we are not our own, we are his. And there is freedom in knowing this. There is freedom to live rich toward others and toward the world. It reveals that there is enough. God owns it all. And he has chosen me. And he has chosen you. And this proves that my life is important. And my life is valuable. And so is your life. 
And it eliminates the need for comparison between me and between you and between other people and judgment between myself and judgment between others. Being takes precedence over having. I can't help but wonder if greed might not be at the core of the political madness that we are experiencing in our country today. The violence we're experiencing in our world today and the dysfunction and the hurt in our own personal lives. To the degree that greed is present, it robs us of God's wealth. The boxes, shelves, and closets of our lives are already full. And when they are full, we have no need, no desire, no room for God. It isolates us from self, from others, and from God. Greed works its deception, and it turns us back on ourselves. And the grammar of our life soon becomes first-person singular. I will do what I will do. I will tear down my barns. I will build bigger barns. I will store my stuff in my new barns. I will relax. I will eat. I will drink. And I will be merry. When we think we are full of ourselves, we leave no room for God and no room for others. When we are self-centered, we can't be Christ-centered. When we aren't Christ-centered, we can never be what Christ created us to be in his image and in his likeness. When we put stuff in place of a relationship with Jesus Christ, we will always miss out on God's best for us. When we have no time for God, we have missed the very purpose of for which we have been created. And when that happens, greed has robbed us. Jesus called that rich man a fool. Wow, that sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it? I thought Jesus just loved everybody and treated everybody with with, with love and, and, you know, we'll just get along. We love each other and everyone will just be happy. But he says in the parable, that man is a fool who closes the barn door after the thief has already escaped my life. He says, life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Jesus says somewhere, and, 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 and we all know that somewhere deep within our lives, we know this. We really do. We know this, don't we? This isn't a new message for us, is it? My guess is that everyone here this morning has experienced the disappointment and the emptiness of finally getting that cherished thing that you dreamed about getting, you worked towards getting, only to find out that it didn't bring the lasting satisfaction you thought it would. Because of life experiences, most of us already know that life does not consist in the abundance of our possessions. And if we know that to be true, what if we lived with this truth? How would our lives be different? What possibilities would it create in your relationships with other people? What might you need to do to claim yourself as God's treasure and to be rich toward God? Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Jesus warned that there are consequences to the way we live our lives. He didn't pull any punches. He called that successful farmer a fool and he pronounced his judgment. This very night, your life will be required from you. 
The man was a fool because he trusted in his wealth to save him and not in his creator. Where are you putting your trust? In your financial portfolio or in God? Jesus further emphasized in his warning, yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not to have a rich relationship with God. So let's go back to the beginning of this passage where Jesus said, don't be greedy for what you have. Real life is not measured by how much we own. This is such a hard lesson to learn, isn't it? I know it is for me. And Jesus understood that. He understood the struggle that we are in. And notice the change of tone that he makes as he finishes out this passage. After he has said this, Notice how he brings comfort to his disciples in verse 22. And then turning to his disciples, so he had given this parable, talked about the judgment, you know, the rich man this night, his his life is going to be required of him. And then Jesus, turning to his disciples, said, And so I tell you, don't worry about everyday life whether you have enough food to eat or clothes to wear. For life consists of far more than food and clothing. Look at the ravens. They don't need to plant or harvest or put food in barns because God feeds them. And you are far more valuable to him than any birds. Can all your worries at a single moment to your life? Of course not. And if worry can't do little things like that, what's the use of worrying over bigger things? Look at the lilies and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, and yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God so wonderfully cares so wonderfully for flowers, that are here today and gone tomorrow, won't he surely more care for you? Oh, you of little faith. And don't worry about food, what to eat and drink. Don't worry about whether God will provide it for you. These things dominate the thoughts of most people, but your father already knows your needs. And he will give you all you need from day to day if you make the kingdom of God your primary concern. So don't be afraid, little flock. For it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give to those in need. This will store up treasure for you in heaven. And the purses of heaven have no holes in them. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it and no moth can destroy it. Wherever your treasure is, there your heart and your thoughts will be also. Where is your treasure? Where is your heart? Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before you uh, with this challenge that Jesus presented before his disciples, but also with this affirmation that you are a God of love, a God who provides and cares for us. A God who has a plan and a purpose for our lives. God, help us on this this journey, this struggle that we are on, that we're in the midst of um, um, dividing, divided between 
being in a right relationship with you and loving all the uh, gifts and the pleasures that this world has to offer. Father, may your Holy Spirit guide us. Lead us on that straight and narrow pathway that leads us into you and into your ultimate presence. And protect us from the deceptive schemes and and deeds of Satan. Help us to, to draw courage and strength from one another as we support and encourage one another in this church family and in our community beyond. Let us be a light shining in the darkness, pointing to you. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.